We say you can't judge a book by its cover. And normally when we say that, we're not talking about books. We're talking about people or things or companies. But the truth is, a book's cover may not tell you much about what's inside. But can we judge a book by its author? Generally, you can judge a book by its author. A book by a conservative will usually be conservative. A book by a liberal will usually be liberal. A book by a doctor of biochemistry will generally be complicated. And a book by Dr. Seuss will generally be simple to understand. You can judge a book by who wrote it, usually, if you know the author. What about this book? What about the Bible? The Bible, we claim, is God's Word. The Bible itself claims to be God's Word. Can we judge a book by the one who wrote it? I believe that we can. What does the fact that this is God's Word tell us about this book? We started two weeks ago with a study, How Can I Know the Bible is True? How Can I Trust the Word of God? By providing a case where an authority, Jesus, endorses the Old and the New Testament, and we know Jesus is an authority because Jesus rose from the dead. Not circular reasoning because the Bible said so. Last week we started looking at this as God's Word. Has God said? That's the question the serpent asked Eve. Is this really God's Word? The Bible claims to be God's Word. The process of God's revelation to man starts with revelation, God to man, the prophets, then inspiration, from the man to the paper, as those authors wrote, and then illumination completing the cycle, as we read it, the Holy Spirit interprets to us. The Bible itself claims to be the Word of God. What does the Bible teach? We call it the inspiration of Scripture, which means that it is literally God-breathed. We said last week, the Bible is not man's best words about God, but God's Word, God's only Word to man. So what does that tell us about this book? It's inspired. Does that mean that it's free from error? Psalm 12, 6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. The psalmist seems to be bending over backwards to tell us that the word of God is very pure. In Psalm 19, 7, we read, The law of the Lord is perfect. We generally take that to mean without error. Converting the soul, powerful. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Psalm 119, verse 140 says, Your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. We love it because it is pure. So the Bible seems to teach that it's not only inspired of God, God's word, but because it's God's word breathed out by God, God doesn't have bad breath, and it's free from error. We call this doctrine inerrancy. Inerrancy means without error. Infallibility is related. It's incapable of error. It implies even more. Because it's God's Word, it can't fail. It can't let us down. So we believe both. The Bible teaches its inerrancy and its infallibility. So what does that mean? We can trust God's Word it's inspired by God because it is God's Word, and it is without error. So today we look at the doctrine of inerrancy. Can we trust God's Word? Does it have any errors? Hi, my name is Pastor Jeff Hartman, pastor of Stamford Baptist Church in Stamford, Connecticut, and this is the pastor's study. We're doing a study now on the Bible. What does the Bible teach about the Bible? It teaches its inspiration. We saw last week, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That doesn't mean that it's inspiring. That means that God breathed it out. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. It is profitable for teaching us doctrine. But is that all that it's profitable for? Is it not reliable when it comes to history and science? Well, a God who can't get history and science right, we can't trust very well for theology and eternal, more important things, right? Actually, Scripture teaches, we saw last week in Psalm 119, verse 128, Therefore, all your precepts, all means all, and that's all all means, 
all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. There are some who want to try and have their cake and eat it too and tell us that the Bible is not God's word. It's not inerrant. It's a human book, best words about God. It contains the word of God, but is not the word of God, and therefore might have some errors, especially when it comes to history and science. Well, the Bible doesn't actually leave us that option where we can say, well, it's reliable for spiritual truths. God is love. Salvation is through Jesus Christ. If it makes errors in history and science, then here it makes an error in theology because this is a theological verse. You see my logic? If it's true about doctrine, it teaches about itself that it is without error in every area. It says all your precepts concerning all things. It doesn't say all spiritual things. So that would be historical and scientific. So the Bible teaches that it is not only God's word inspired, but inerrant. Is it inerrant when it says that? Or is that an error? Let's look at the doctrine of inerrancy specifically. First, when I talk about inerrancy, I want you to understand that suggesting that a book could be inerrant is not illogical. It's not impossible. It's not that it doesn't make any sense. Let me show you why. It is possible for a fallible person, imperfect person, to write a book without errors. I could fill a book out with mathematical equations that are all true. Zero is less than one. One is less than two. Two is less than three. Three is less than four. Four is less than five. And on and on into infinity. And every one of those statements is true. It is easy enough for a human being to create a book that has no errors. Now, if it's possible for you and I to make a book without errors, isn't it also possible for a God who we believe to be inerrant and infallible to do so? Can't he do it if it's written by a person who's without error and without sin? I wonder sometimes how people can have such love and respect for Jesus, often called the Word, and yet have contempt and disrespect for the Bible, God's written Word. I believe that's because Jesus for them is distant, and they can romanticize his life. They can make him into their own image. They can imagine a, God, a Jesus that suits them. But the Bible is right there in front of us, and because it confronts us in our sin, it is more offensive. The Bible is considered crude by its critics, picked apart for its inconsistencies. But when Jesus was near, was he accepted and romanticized? No, when Jesus was near, he was cru crucified, not because he was so popular, because he made everyone feel good, but because, like the Bible, he confronted them in their sin. God's word today is the same as Jesus picked apart because it offends us. So the question is clearly not, could God have produced an inerrant word of God? Of course he could. It's not illogical to say that God could create a perfect book. The question is not, could God produce a human document without error? The question is, did God? So, to say an omnipotent God could not produce a human document without error is illogical. And did not the same omnipotent God come in human form and remain free from sin? That's what the Bible teaches about Jesus. So the question is not, could he? The question is, did he? In 1 John 4.20 we read, If someone says, I love God and I hate his, my brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? I'd like to apply this differently. If you say, I love Jesus, but I don't like the Bible, how can you say that when it is Jesus who endorses the Bible, Jesus who is the author of the Bible? You haven't seen Jesus, so it's easy to love him, right? But you have seen the Bible, and if you can't love that, then you really don't love Jesus, is what I'm suggesting. 
So the question is not, could God produce an inerrant witness? The question is, did God produce an inerrant word? Is that what this book is? Second thing I'd like to point out is that inerrancy is consistent with Scripture. Scripture itself talks about itself as inerrant. Now, God is without error, Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So here is one thing God cannot do. God cannot lie. And if this is his word, then it can't contain errors, either intended or unintended. Another way of saying that is Hebrews 6.18. Two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. When God speaks, he speaks truth. When there is no light and he says, let there be light, there is light. Because God cannot speak in error. This is infallibility. Scripture is incapable of error because if it indeed is God's word inspired by him, then he is incapable of speaking in error. Remember, inspiration literally means breathed out. God breathed out his word, <clears throat> and because God is without error, if this is his word, then it must also be without error. And so, as we saw earlier, the Bible teaches its own inerrancy. Psalm 12, 6, the words of the Lord are pure words. They are his words, therefore they're pure. The law of the Lord is perfect, Psalm 19, 7 says. The testimony of the Lord is sure. And so, because it is God's word, it is inspired by God, it is pure, it is perfect, because you can judge a book by its author. If this is not the book of David, the book of Elijah, the book of Matthew, if this is the word of God, then it must be inerrant. Psalm 119, verse 40, 140 your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. Psalm 119, 160, one we haven't looked at thus far. The entirety of your word is truth. How much? All of it. And every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Not that every one that is righteous endures forever. No, they all are true. It is all without error. It is all pure. It is all perfect. How many different ways can the Bible say it? The Bible is telling us about itself. If we want to trust it for anything, we have to trust it about itself. It's telling us that it's perfect. Now, remember going back two weeks ago, that's not why we believe it, that we can trust it, because we trust it, not because the Bible says so, self-witness, but we believe it because Jesus said so, and that's where we start with history, with the science of history, Jesus rose from the dead, therefore Jesus is God. Jesus says the Bible is true. And so, to be consistent, we must either accept what it says about itself as inerrant, or reject it totally. If you don't believe that it's without error, why do you waste your time reading a book that can't even get itself right? Third, inerrancy does not mean there will be no difficulties. Let's be honest. Yes, it's God's Word, and God's Word is reliable, but that doesn't mean that we won't have problems. Isaiah 55 explains, My thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. So this book is God's thoughts, it's God's words, but because God is God and we are not, there's going to be some times where there are problems not with God's word, but there are problems with us. So there are problems in God's word, things that we just don't get because God's on a different level. Yes, he revealed it to men and he used men to write it down, but sometimes it just doesn't come through to us, not because there's something wrong with the word, but there's something wrong with us. Peter admits this in 2 Peter 3.16. As he's writing about Paul, he says, As also in all his epistles, speaking them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they also do with the rest of scriptures. Notice that Peter calls Paul's writings 
scriptures, equating them to the authoritative Old Testament. But he admits that he's got some problems when he reads Paul's letters, because they are deep, they are hard to understand. And yes, if you are a beginning Christian, yes, if you don't know the scriptures well, sometimes you'll read it and say, wow, what's going on here? And not grasp it. Peter admits sometimes there's difficulties. Sometimes we just have trouble. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man, the person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, the person who's not saved by Christ, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, talking about the Bible, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. God's word is on a different level. It's coming from heaven. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Yes, but they are spiritually discerned, and so don't be surprised if some things seem a little bit difficult. There are those who object to ethical difficulties in Scripture, and so they complain that the Bible condones polygamy or slavery or even encourages brutal wars, that it encourages things that they find objectionable, like capital punishment. Sometimes the Bible does record these things, like polygamy or slavery, without approving of them or even disapproving. They just mention it historically. That doesn't mean that it endorses it. The, eth the ethical difficulties don't provide errors. They just offend some people. But these things are not a proof that there is an error in Scripture. It does tell us that Abraham had two wives. It doesn't approve of it. It does tell us the atrocious things that some of those who are recording God's Word, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. A history book that tells us about the Nazi Holocaust, although that's very offensive to us, doesn't mean that the historical book is not true. So we can't dismiss the Bible because of our so-called modern ethical standards. Our standards are not official. They're not godly oftentimes. Ethical difficulties are not enough. But there are others who have scientific difficulties with Scripture. They claim that Scripture is hopelessly out of date in its inconsistencies. And when, especially when it talks about special creation and a young earth, the Bible begins by making a statement that is outrageous according to modern naturalistic science. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.27, not only the heavens and the earth, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Made male and female, he created them. That's now become even uh, outrageous. Oh, male and female, there's more genders than that. No, the Bible tells us right up front, one, God made everything, and two, God made human beings and he made us special. And so modern science, naturalistic, atheistic science, rejects that out of hand. Not because there's no evidence of design. No, there's a lot of evidence of design. But because they dismiss the possibility of special creation, and so they see what they want to see. Everywhere we look, there is evidence of complexity, of beauty, of intention, of purpose, of design. We have two options. Either nothing made everything, or someone made everything. And we know science tells us that nothing comes from nothing. Science tells us that every creation has a creator. So actually, it's not science that tells us God didn't make the heavens and the earth. It is an assumption. It's actually faith. It's actually religion. An atheistic religion says, no God. God made everything, and he made us. And he didn't make us through evolution. He made us specifically. That's what the Bible teaches. Those who dismiss these claims say that the Bible then therefore can't be true. But the truth is, the actual evidence does point to a creator with intelligent power. He's all-powerful. He's intelligent. He has a purpose. Spontaneous generation, life from non-life, has been disproven scientifically. We know life can't come from non-life. Louis Pasteur proved that. And yet... All of modern atheistic science is based upon that. All of the missing links continue to be missing. And why do they believe in billions and billions of years? Well, because the fossils 
show evidently there's a record of improvement. Actually, every single fossil is evidence of a catastrophe. We call it Noah's flood. Fossils don't naturally occur. They only occur quickly and underneath great pressure. Where did all the fossils come from? Actually, most of the scientific evidence points to a divine creation and a specific cr creation of human beings. What about the billions and billions of years? Scripture says that God made the heavens and the earth in six days. And if you throw out Genesis, you still have a young earth because right in the Ten Commandments, that's where this comes from, Exodus 20, the reason we keep the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath, because in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, every seven-day week is a reminder that God created the heavens and the earth. And he did it according to Exodus, not Genesis, in six days. Therefore, there is a young earth. A lot of scientific evidence. I would say most scientific real evidence points to a younger universe, a younger creation. Some object to these scientific statements, but the evidence doesn't point one way or the other. You have to accept by faith an atheistic explanation, everything's always been there, or a Big Bang, and where did the Big Bang come from, or a purpose and a design, a creator. So when it comes to the origin of life, Real evidence points to life had to have a creator. Life comes from life. The age, spontaneous generation, missing links, the fossils themselves. The real scientific evidence points to a younger earth and a creator, and there is a special design to human beings. But here's the real troubling one for theologians, for pastors like myself. What about the apparent contradictions? If scripture contradicts itself, then it can be proven that it's in error. For instance, pointed out by many unbelievers, Numbers 25 in the Old Testament says those who died in the plague were 24,000. But in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, in one day, 23,000 fell. Well, we have an error here, right? It's obvious that both of these numbers can't be right. So one's wrong, and so Scripture can't be trusted because it can't even get the number of people who died right. Well, let's, let's think about it a little bit more. It's obvious that these are rounded numbers, isn't it? It's not exactly 24,000 or exactly 23,000 that died. And so if they are estimates, you can round up and round down, and an optimist might round down and a pessimist might round up on this case. We do that sometimes with prices. We see something is $23.99, we say it's $24. Are we in error? No, we're talking about rounding. And here we have two numbers. It's obvious both of them are rounded, and one could be rounding up, one could be rounding down. Or actually, it could be 24,000 who died, but 23,000 died in one day. There are many different explanations where both of these numbers are accurate. Not to the number, perhaps, because it was probably not exactly 24,000 or 23,000, but perhaps 23,000 around died on one day, and another thousand died over the following week. That's what numbers is claiming. But there are some contradictions that are much more troubling. Like, for instance, when it comes to Jesus' genealogy, Matthew gives us an entirely different genealogy than Luke. And I've read liberal scholars who say, well, obviously they're both made up and neither one can be trusted. But in Matthew, we go from Abraham and we go forward to David, to Solomon, to Jeconiah, the 28th level. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, who was born Jesus. Well, Luke goes back further he does it backwards, but if you put it, turn around the other way, he says, he goes all the way back to Adam and Noah. Then he goes Abraham, David, and then instead of Solomon, he goes Nathan, and then Heli as the grandfather of Jesus instead of Jacob. So from David on, it's totally different. And some liberal scholars say that's because the Bible's not reliable. Well, they're missing a very important note. 
every one of us have two genealogies. I've traced my genealogy back. I started by tracing uh, back to the Mayflower and then further back to royalty and then back to the Dark Ages, both for me and for my wife, and found that we have some common ancestors. I said to my wife when I first found out, hey, 23rd cousin, all the way back to the 1300s. Well, the truth is, I have two genealogies, and so does my wife, and so do you. Every one of us have a genealogy through our father and through our mother. And Jesus' genealogy according to the flesh, according to his father, would be Abraham, David, and the kingly line that goes through Jacob to Joseph, who was not Jesus' earthly father, and it's very clear, Matthew saying that this is Joseph's line, the kingly line, therefore Jesus as his adopted son, firstborn, is the heir to the throne of David. This is his kingly line, but not his fleshly line, because Jesus wasn't related to Joseph. He was the son of Mary, begotten of the Holy Spirit. This one is going through the line of Mary, his maternal genealogy, because this is his fleshly line. This is his royal line. This is his genetic line. Adam, Noah, Abraham, David, Nathan, also a son of David, not his king son, Solomon, but literal son, his fleshly son, Nathan, through Heli, who as was supposed the father of Joseph. So this is Mary's line. We believe that Luke interviewed Mary and gives us Mary's perspective in the story and so this is not a contradiction. This is actually scientifically accurate. Every one of us have two genealogies. They don't contradict one another. They support one another. And just like my wife and I are distantly related, so are Joseph and Mary, both as descendants of David. But let me share with you a personal contradiction that bothered me as a pastor. I was reading through the Bible every year, which I've done now for 50 years and as I do, sometimes I come across things and I remember another place where I read that. In Ezra, there is a long list of all of the children of Israel that came back from the dispersion, from the captivity, and came back to the Holy Land. And as he lists out over 100 different families, groups, some of them had different numbers. So I would compare Ezra 2 where it says the children of Aaron were 775, and then flip over in Nehemiah chapter 7, where it says there are 652. Every one of the digits is number. 7 becomes 6, 7 becomes 5, 5 becomes 2. Everyone was wrong, and you say, well, maybe there were 775 who left the captivity and 652 who made it because several died on the way. But some of the other ones are more suspicious, like Pahath Moab has 2,812 in Ezra, but 2,818 in Nehemiah. And that's only got one numeral off. The last one changes from 2 to 8. Now, that's more likely a death on the way there. Maybe there were six babies that were born and no one died. Zatu is off by 100 Zatu goes from 945 to 845. Well, now this starts to sound like, okay, this one just got all three garbled. This one got the last number off. This one got the first number off. It's starting to look like these are transcriptional errors, differences because someone made an error in copying. For instance, Bani goes from 642 to 648, only one numeral off. Bebai goes off from 623 to 628, only one numeral off. Asgad from 1222 to 2322. This is perhaps the most suspicious one. It is up by exactly 1100 because the one becomes a two, the two becomes a three, but it's 22 and 22. So this begins to look more and more like transcriptional copyist errors. 666 goes to 67, only off by one. 2056, each one goes up, the 5 goes up to 6, the 6 goes up to 7. Aiden goes up from 454 to 655, only one number right, the 50 in the middle. 
His eye goes from 323 to 328, only one number off. But what we are seeing is there are several errors. Out of the 45 numbers that are given there, 20 of them, almost half of them, are wrong or contradictory. So I challenge you, go to Ezra and to Nehemiah chapter 7 and compare the numbers and then look and see how many are off, are wrong, are in error. And I had heard all my life pastors hold up the Bible and say, there's not one error in the Word of God. And if there is one, you prove it to me, you show me. And it was troubling me because I could find 20 errors according to the Bible right there. When you add up the ones in all those numbers, there's 24,144 in Ezra, 25,406 in Nehemiah. Both of them get the same total because there are other groups of 42,360. But that troubled me because I couldn't honestly say no errors in this book when I found 20 myself. And so I began to pray about it and study and what's going on. And even conservative scholars just dismissed this. The footnote in my Bible said, it's obvious there are transcriptional errors, copyist errors. But I thought, if I can't trust God's word concerning these numbers, how can I trust God's word when it talks about itself and its inerrancy? And therefore, how can I trust God when it comes to what it says about me and my eternity? These are wildly contradictory, definitely the same lists, and yet 20 contradictions. And so then I began to read and to pray and to study, and none of my books helped me. None of my studies I got all these different commentaries in my office, and they just said, well, it's obviously an error. But I finally, after pouring over it and praying about it for a year, finally came across, and it was right there in front of me the whole time. Ezra says, at the beginning of the list, Ezra 2.1, now, these are the people of the province who came back from the captivity. These are the ones. So I'm going to take Ezra's word for it. He recorded the number of people, and he got the numbers right. Nehemiah says, 105 years later, I found a register of the genealogy of those who had come up in the first return and found written in it. He found a copy of Ezra's numbers, and he accurately records to us what that list said. Nehemiah's record, the one that he found, had 20 transcriptional errors in it. Ezra's number is reliable. That's how many came back. Nehemiah found a book with errors in it, a population number, a genia. He found all of these numbers in this list. And the list was, after 105 years, had some problems in it. Nehemiah didn't make the error. Someone went along. But Nehemiah gives us an accurate record of what it said. 42,000 is exactly right. Here's what happens. In the Old Testament, Satan says, you won't die if you disobey God. Was that a lie? Yes. But the Bible records that lie accurately. And here, Nehemiah records some errors, and he records them accurately. And then it occurred to me, do you know what? This isn't proof that the Bible contains errors. This is the proof that the Bible records for us accuracy because if human beings are going to give us this book, they would correct this, right? If this wasn't God's word and human beings made it up, some copies would have come along and said, hey, wait a minute, Ezra and Nehemiah contradict each other. Let's fix this. Nobody ever fixed it, and here's why. The Hebrew scribes, they trusted this as God's perfect word, and they recorded it exactly as it was, and they didn't correct it. They didn't correct it because it's not man's best words about God. It's God's word to man. And so they, can, they just wrote it down, and maybe they figured it out quicker than I did, and they said, oh, Nehemiah is recording a 105-year-old record of that group. But here's the truth. This is evidence to us that God's word can be trusted, and God's people have trusted it throughout the years because they didn't go trying to correct it, to try and make it look good. The problem is, the Bible does record errors. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. 
That's not true. There is a God, but the fool did say it. And so that is the truth. And we can trust the word of God because it is trustworthy. I want to show you a puzzle. This puzzle has stumped a lot of people. Can you connect these nine dots with just four continuous lines? And so if you start trying to go, okay, one, two, three, four leaves out the middle one. One, two, three, four leaves out this one. Okay, one, two, three, four leaves out this one. And people will strive to connect all nine dots with only four continuous lines without lifting your pen or pencil from the paper. And they say it's impossible. And so if you try to go this way or you try to go that, this way, no matter how many ways you go, you can't do it, we say. Oh, it's impossible. It's an error. But actually, there is a way to do it. And what you need to do is start outside the box, go through the diagonal, down through the vertical, up through the diagonal, and then here. And with four continuous lines, you can easily connect those dots. When people say the Bible has errors, they are thinking inside the box. And they say, oh, 20 errors in Ezra and Nehemiah. But if you go outside the box, and hey, God is by definition outside the box, isn't he? The word of God came from outside of the box, and there is a solution. If you come across what you assume to be an error, then you better assume that you're an error and not the word of God. Why? Because it's God's word, and you can trust it, and you can judge this book by its author. Our perfect God, who cannot lie, has given us his word, and you can trust it. Even when it appears to be an error, it's probably us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your perfect word. We thank you we can trust it. Lord, help us to not only trust it, but to read it and to obey it. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Join us again next week for another study from God's word, about God's word, from the pastor's study.